Welcome to Interviews from Mexico. I'm Laura Carlson, and I'll be your host as we look at cutting-edge issues with the men and women who know them best, here on Telesur. <laughs> The Mexican government recently announced that there are 40,000 disappeared persons in the country. 40,000! And the number could be much larger because it's underreported and there isn't a reliable database. Maria Herrera has become the face of that tragedy. More than 10 years ago, two of her sons were disappeared in the state of Guerrero. Later, two more sons were disappeared in Veracruz, along with seven other people. She carries their photographs everywhere she goes in her quest to find them and to pressure the government to search for and find all the disappeared people in Mexico. Today we're very fortunate to have with us here in the studio Maria Herrera. She's the founder of Families in Search of Loved Ones, Maria Herrera, and also of the national organization Enlaces Nacionales. Doña Maria, thanks so much for being with us here today. Thanks to you, Laura, for giving us this opportunity and for being an ally to so many of us who are suffering with this situation all over the country. Thank you so much. Doña Maria, tell us, how did you, out of such a deep grief of losing four sons, begin to organize with and for families of the disappeared in Mexico? When we were part of the movement for peace during those huge caravans across the north and south of the country, I found out that it wasn't just me who was facing this situation, because when I started my search, I was searching for 11 people who are my two sons who disappeared in Atoyac de Álvarez, Guerrero, Jesús Salvador y Raúl Trujillo Herrera, and their five co-workers, Joel Franco Águila, Rafael Cervantes Rodríguez, José Luis Barajas Alcázar, Luis Carlos Barajas Díaz, and Flavio Alejandro Higadera. They disappeared with my first two sons. And the second incident, which took place in 2010, Gustavo and Luis Armando, two of my sons, were disappeared, along with a nephew, Jaime Lopez Carlos, and Gabriel Melo Ulloa my granddaughter's husband. I started, as I told you, I started searching, but I never imagined all the things that were going on across the country. When the movement for peace began, I started to find out that everywhere you go, you just find more pain and suffering, and I was just shocked. What we saw during the movement for peace, and I'm very thankful for that movement, the way they took us in and supported us. I am so thankful because with them we started to attend workshops and we started to search in a different way. Before then we had mostly searched in government offices. What we wanted was to search ourselves, to find our loved ones. And the government wasn't responding. Uh, they, you felt that they weren't searching or doing their job in that sense? In fact, they have never done their job. To this day, I think that they never did their job because I never heard about any suspects, nor I have I ever gotten any information about my children. And when we realized, well, we weren't going to find them there, we decided to organize ourselves in a different way. My son, Juan Carlos, and I agreed that we needed to seek the support of society because I have always thought, I've always said that when society supports us, it's easier to join forces and achieve your goals. And it was another one of the big lessons of the movement for peace with justice and dignity, the response of the society to a movement of people who had lost, whether to disappeared or to 
or to assassination who had lost their loved ones. It was really a major moment when Mexican society woke up to the problem. That's right. In addition to raising awareness of her pain, the national tragedy that Mexico's living through, something that the Mexican government has never wanted to accept. I'm referring to the previous governments. They've never accepted that we are living through a national emergency. So as I told you, we decided to join forces instead. I told my children that we had to talk to all levels of government, but when they didn't respond to us, we decided to seek support elsewhere in churches. Now we are involved with churches across the country and many around the world because before that's why we call organization National Links Enlaces Nacionales because we try to link up all the groups, all the people who want to struggle for peace, to achieve peace. And that's where our strategy of working with churches has started because, because we know that they represent a large part of the society. And in fact, we can see the results because the churches have helped a lot to make our cause more visible and to raise awareness across society. And it's giving us a lot of hope, and now it seems like the government is taking us a little more seriously. Not a little bit, they're taking us more seriously. And we feel like, yes, now they are directing the resources that they think are appropriate to help raise awareness, and also they are taking action. And that gives us hope that we will soon be able to find our loved ones. Well, I want to talk a little bit more about the role of the new government and what changes you've seen since Lopez Obrador took office in terms of attitudes and, and measures to search for the disappeared. But first, let's go back a little ways. Tell us what is this new model that you developed for working with society and searching directly for loved ones in the field? Well, at the moment, we are working in three areas. First, we're not leaving the government out of it. We're still demanding that the government fulfill their responsibilities. And second, we're getting the churches involved so they can do their part too. Because their job is just administering sacraments and nothing else. No. Pain and suffering, that's what brings us together. And what we want is to search to find. We can put everything else aside. But we do need a lot of support from society and from every level of the government. Mm -hmm. The churches and the powers, the three branches of government, the executive, legislative, and judicial, we're demanding that they join forces because that's the only way we'll be able to achieve our goal. But having support from society is even more important. And I think that society is listening to us, is understanding us. Well, we saw that in this last brigade, the search brigade uh, that took place in the state of Guerrero with over 180 people involved, including family members of disappeared persons from all over the country, the work that was done in the local communities, and of course, Guerrero is one of the most violent states in Mexico, with the churches, with the schools, and then the direct search. Uh, in in the in communities where where community members actually gave tips about where they thought the bodies were buried, um, what were the results of that brigade? It's the biggest effort so far of your organization, right? Well, look, honestly, I am very happy because this is the first time that we worked, for example, with schools. In the past, we had only worked with with high schools, middle schools high schools and higher levels, like universities, for example. But we had never worked with elementary school children. When we did it in Huitzuco, that was the first time. How do you talk to children that young about something as, as powerful as disappearance? 
I got involved little by little, and when I started to see how these children were reacting, I was very surprised, because I didn't know how to make them see that, well, crime had taken my children away from me. I didn't know how to introduce that problem there, but children are perceptive. And right away, they started sharing mm. what they were feeling, what they were thinking. And these are children who live in communities where they, they have experienced many times the impact of the violence of organized crime and militarization. On their own, they started talking about what they mm. were feeling, the terror, the fear that they feel when they see the army, the navy, in the street, when they see people with guns. They said when they come by in their trucks and all that and they take people, they've taken people here too. The kids started saying all these on their own. They've taken people away here too, they say, they took one of my cousins, they took, and they just keep on talking. So I can see that even little kids understand how serious the problem is, and that's something else that the government hasn't taken into account. They think that just because they are kids, I thought the same thing. I thought, how am I going to communicate with these kids? I didn't want to scare them, I didn't want to traumatize them, but they've opened up on their own and they started talking about what they are living through in these communities. And that made it easier for me to keep talking. And we also used art to connect with them. You can do a lot with art and you can raise consciousness too. And we had a lot of help from some groups like Marabunta and other groups that were supporting us to help us do this work. We had another group of clowns, acrobats, things like that, and they did amazing things, an amazing job, because they made the kids happy. At times there was fear, and yes, we could see it, but we also told them that there were a lot of ways to use their time, little by little, to create new ways of life, and from there, to instill the values and moral principles that had been lost. And from there, well, that's the situation we're going through. It's due to a loss of values, of principles. Yeah, the 4th Brigade said that they had a number of objectives, one of which is to find remains so that they can be identified and returned to their families, which is a big part of the citizen search campaign. But then the others were to build peace and to rebuild communities. Uh, and so this sounds like that's a part of that. How, how do you work these objectives together? Well, the place to start, Laura, is trying to gain people's trust. Because when you go to this kind of places, this kinds of areas, people are terrified. In fact, we could see the fear in Tetelilla. One of the places we went to, the parents, when they found out we were coming, they didn't know what we were doing, and they pulled their kids out of school. We were going to do an event at the school, but the parents started showing up one by one and taking their kids home because they don't trust anyone. They don't know who is coming into their homes, their spaces, and of course, they have a good reason, right? But then they listened to us and they saw what we were doing because the main thing we want to do is we want to end the violence but starting at the bottom in schools with children so that they'll have a different way of interacting with each other as classmates, as friends. And from that point, we can start to build what we call an instrument of peace. A culture of peace. Uh, a culture of peace because, as I told you, there are many ways to build it. And the children start to trust us because as we become more established in these places, we were camping in the church in Huitzuco, 
in our house of solidarity, the house of Christianity, and any kids, any kids from other schools started showing up there because I imagine that they told their parents at home and the parents came with their children to wait for us. In fact, it was such a beautiful thing because you can really feel the support. At night, the mothers brought us guayaba, atole, atole, coffee, and you could see that we were really building trust. And they told us this has never happened before because these places are so forgotten, both by the government and by society. There's even a lack of priests for the churches, in all the churches, Anglican churches, Catholic churches, and everything else. And that creates an opportunity for other people to occupy those spaces and use them for their own purposes. And people will, people just take Pero what comes, but fortunately, they knew the value of, I would say that we made a big effort, but when we think about how successful it was, it doesn't feel like it was so hard. It was so beautiful. It gave us hope that soon, because these relationships are how we get information about where to find places where people are buried in hidden graves. Yeah, it's terrible. And we've been realizing that everywhere we go, we're t walking through clandestine cemeteries. I told my comrades, it feels like we're stepping on, like we're stepping on our loved ones because we don't know where they are. But it's through all this work we do before the brigades, that's how we get information. And when people start to trust us more, they give us information about where we can go search, where we can go search. Very, very dif difficult, but in the brigade, for example, there were seven bodies found, bone fragments, all of which could lead to the identi identification of people whose families have been searching for them for years. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the core of, of much of the work you do, even though from the outside it might seem like a very, very difficult thing to do. What do you think, now moving to this new situation with the new government, uh, have you noticed a change, and what hopes do you have that this problem will finally really be tackled? Well, look, I think that there's support, or rather political will. Now they're telling us that there is political will. I hope that that's true, and that is not just, you know, simulation. Mm -hmm. Because with the former government, what they used to do was they tried to block our work. They said we couldn't go out and search because we didn't have the skills, because we didn't have the knowledge. We needed to search and that we would contaminate evidence, and that could bring us legal problems. However, what we just saw that Encinas came to the brigade. The Undersecretary of Human Rights. And he was there with his pickaxe, helping us dig. That opened us to many different possibilities for us. It strengthened us. It strengthened us in a way that no one imagined. We couldn't imagine it because in the past, instead of supporting us, they tried to get in our way and to scare us, to tell us that we can't do it. Now with that, Encinas did, he opened door, doors for us, which means that when the government makes a decision uh -huh. and has the will, it can be done. And that's what we've always said. The pain we feel can't be lifted by anything. We are going to go as far as we can, as far as our lives takes us, to keep searching for our children, for our loved ones. And I think that even if the government tries to hold us back, we will keep going 
through civil disobedience and will mm -hmm. be peaceful because we never carry weapons. Well, yeah, you've said that even if the government begins to do its job to search for the disappeared people, this grassroots organization of family members of the disappeared will continue with all the knowledge and the lessons and and the level of organization that they've obtained, that you've obtained uh, so far. So finally, I'd like to ask you, because we've come to the end of the show, what can people do to help out, both people in Mexico, and I know you've done a lot of international work as well, to support your organization? Everyone, every person who has a disappeared family member will take advantage of every opportunity. We always travel to different places. Sometimes we have an invitation, sometimes we don't. But whenever we do an activity outside of this, of this country, we also try to raise awareness because we, I told you, our organization is national links. But now we know that the links are international because we've had international support. And now the main thing we are asking for is that people stay with us, to keep supporting us, because right now we have a serious problem. We don't have a way of identifying all of the remains that we found. And for us, it's an urgent for the bodies to be identified, but we don't have the tools we need to do it. There is will in the universities, and we want the universities to get the tools so they can help us with identification, because we know that there is an infinity of human remains here, thousands of bodies, and how can I know if my sons are among those remains? And that's something that hurts us a lot, and we need to support from, we need support from society, including international support, so that we can identify all these remains. It's something that's urgent for us. Yeah, as a family. I don't want to know. die. I don't want to die without knowing yeah. that where my son's bodies are. I am being able to take them home so that they can rest, because I don't want anyone else from my family to keep living through this situation that I am living through. I don't want them to keep searching because I know that they will. Because just now in this brigade, one of my grandsons wanted to come to be there and to help look for his father. I don't want that to happen. I want, because there is a chance, because miracles do happen, and my sons might still be alive. But one way or another, I need to know. We need society, even if it's not in this country. There are so many Mexicans in the United States, and there are a lot of good people in the United States that have supported us, that have helped us. And that's why we always head out again. There are our neighbors, and we ask them to support us so we can identify our loved ones. We aren't going to stop looking. We are going to keep looking for as long as our lives allow us. And we need help to be able to get to the universities the tools they need to identify our children. Well, we've got the email on the screen so people can get in touch to help out. Doña Maria Herrera, thank you so much for joining us here on Interviews from Mexico. Well, thanks you, Laura, and thanks to all the people who had given us this space to you for giving us this opportunity and the people who have had the goodwill to listen to us. Yeah. Thank you again. And thank you. There it is, an opportunity for people to get involved. Join us next week on Interviews from Mexico. Mm -hmm.